Bill, I don't know how I'm supposed to take this or not. I, I don't know, but I just see in the in the chat here. I'd rather watch the fanatic polish Farzi's head. <laughs> I, I don't that know too. what that. I don't know what that's a reference to just yet. But that's oh, that's uh, that's GI GI So and uh, talking to my my girl Babs uh, out there. I believe. Yeah, that's good times. That's good times there. Um, hey, I know when we spoke earlier in the week. You had an issue with special teams. It's something we hadn't talked about a lot. We talked about the punter. Obviously, it's all set up. Jake Elliott, no problem there. But punter, kick returner, punt returner, whatever it was, anything help you out tonight with any optimism or increased pessimism while watching the special teams tonight? Yeah, my concern is last year they were in the bottom three for kickoff returns against, and they were in the bottom two for net punting yards. We said going into the game, the biggest thing was – we needed to stay healthy. Well, it looks like they may have lost their best special teams player from last year in Sean Bradley, and that's going to hurt. This was an area they needed to improve this year. They got away with it all season last year until Super Bowl 57, where that punt return came back to haunt them. So we really need to make sure that that special team's coverage is solidified. And you saw it tonight. Some of those kick returns against – it looked like they were one missed tackle away from that guy breaking a long return. So I still thought they looked a little bit shaky. Nice play on that punt return, forcing the fumble, recovering it in the other team's red zone. But, yeah, that's, that's an area that I'm concerned about. And Sean Bradley's led the team in the last two years with special teams tackles. So let's hope he's okay, but it did not look good. Yeah, how about Rick Lovato coming down the field to be able to pick up that ball as well? That was that was pretty great to see. Um one name we haven't mentioned yet, and I was a little surprised to see how the Eagles were using him. Uh, Tyler Steen was a tackle throughout his entire college career. He was drafted as a guard. He is supposed to be a guard. There was supposed to be a battle at guard. It turns out uh, that was a lie. And now Tyler Steen is playing left tackle, and he started at left tackle for the Eagles tonight. I, I, I would consider his uh, first NFL experience to be – more down than up, but not a terrible debut. I'll put it like that. Didn't do anything to really impress me. Got bull rushed a couple of times, but I was just bottom line surprised to see him line up at the tackle position as opposed to the guard position. What did you make of his performance and use uh, tonight, Bill? I was very surprised when the starting lineup came out that they had him at the left tackle position, not because I think that he's going to beat Cam Jurgens out, but right. we all thought that he was going to learn that right guard position to be the first backup there. So I was surprised. And he did what you would expect from a rookie in his first game. He had some good plays. There was that one where they blitzed from around the outside and he had two guys come and he needed to pick one guy or another. I'm not sure that that was necessarily on him. It looked like DeAndre Swift coming out of the backfield may have missed the blitz assignment, I'm not sure. I don't know what blocking scheme they had in there, but he runs right by him, and Steen was kind of in a tough spot. He had two guys. He had to pick one. He picked wrong, and it disrupted the play. But you expect that from a young guy. But, yeah, I was more surprised, not by his play, but just where they had him. But, yeah, no battle at all. Cam Jurgens is your starting right guard. It's amazing. Last year, no Reed Blankenship's playing. Cam Jurgens playing. This year, those guys are locked in as starters. Mm -hmm. uh, he did rotate around a little bit, but I was surprised to see him out there in the uh, early goings of the game to be uh, in the spot that he was there at uh, left tackle. Uh, without further ado, let's go down to Baltimore and talk to our man, our uh, co-host there of Birds 365, John McMullen. Let's talk all things Eagles preseason opener. And, John, I'll just start out with this. Uh, Kenny Gainwell, the man you have dubbed as RB1, uh, not in the lineup tonight. I, I would assume that's because we don't really need to see the guy that's going to be your starting uh, running back to this point. What would you make uh, of that there, John? Well, I was, I was, you know, ready to spike the football in the end zone, Mark, and say, yeah, I told you so. But Nick, Nick Sirianni did uh, put a break on it a, a little bit. I don't know if I believe him. But he's trying to say that that running backs need to be hit and that he, he wants those guys to, you know, build up a tolerance for that, which is understandable. And it was Penny and Swift's turn. And, you know, against Cleveland, Gainwell and Scott will get some run to make sure they get hit. If you look at it that way, then maybe Penny and Swift are ahead of them. But everything I see in practice tells me that's not the case. 
Um, there are a couple other guys, Quez Watkins, Britton Cubby. I was surprised, uh, didn't get any run. Now they had hamstring issues. So, uh, Nick confirmed that they were scheduled to play, but they felt a little tightness and, you know, the Eagles, they're going to err on the side of caution, but yeah, Cam Jurgens, um, you know, full fledged deference card, Reed Blankenship, full fledged deference card. Those guys you can look at and say, yeah, they're a big part of this team and a big part of their philosophy. And I heard you guys talking about Tyler Steen. They made that move in practice when they decided that Cam was the starting uh, right guard. And remember, he's taken every team, every first team rep. The only time he hasn't been first team at right guard is the few reps they let Kelsey rest. Then he moves to center and Tyler Steen took a few, but Every single first-team rep, Cam Jurgens has been on the field. And Jeff Statlin noted, look, if, you, if you're going to be a backup, and that's what Tyler Steen's going to be, you got to cross-train. And left tackle is his natural position, so it's probably a little bit easier for him. And he's been the second-team left tackle for about four or five days now. John, if N'Kobe Dean didn't have the injury last week, would we have seen him tonight? Yeah, it's a good question, uh, Bill, because, you know, that's one guy I just mentioned with Quez and Britton. In fact, I expected them to keep him limited in practice on and all the days, you know, run together for me this time of year. But the last practice on Thursday, I expected them to keep uh, Nicobe limited so they wouldn't be um, playing him in this particular game. He was a full go, and they still sat him. So Nick didn't address that specifically, but yeah, I, I, you know, from their standpoint, he's the starting middle linebacker, and the question is who's going to play next to him. And that's a wide open, that's a legit wide open competition. It could be Nicholas Morrow, it could be Christian Ellis, it could be Miles Jack, it could be Zach Cunningham. It could be a combination of Zach Cunningham on early downs and Miles Jack on passing downs, a bunch of different ways. But N'Kobe Dean is going to be the starting middle linebacker. Uh, and, yeah, he's getting some of that deference. I don't know if he would have gotten it if he was completely healthy and he hadn't tweaked the ankle. Jordan Davis played. So, you know, there's a guy who's taken first-team reps consistently, but he's a young player. Uh, who hasn't played a ton, and they got him some reps. I think Nicobe would be in that category uh, if he was completely healthy. But, again, they're always going to be cautious. That's just the nature of it and, and what they believe in. Um, and, and, and that's what I think is going on with Nicobe. But anybody who thinks Nicobe's in danger of losing a starting job, not happening. Not unless they bring in somebody else from outside the organization with more relevance. John, when you and I spoke, I think it was on Friday, uh, yesterday, with Bo Wolf at The Athletic, Bo had predicted a shakeup at a certain position, that position being safety. at the. When you look at the depth chart after this game, you're going to see a major shakeup. Sidney Brown could be that number one guy. I think he certainly helped his stock in trying to become that number one guy tonight. Do you expect to see that shakeup this week against the Browns at practice and then on Thursday night as well? I do. I've been expecting to see that for a week or so, to be honest. I'm surprised it's taken that long. But you guys got to see the burst that I've been talking about Oof. with Sidney Brown. It's just different than every other safety on the roster. Now, sometimes he's going in the wrong direction. That's the problem. But, you know, at, at some point when somebody's that talented and that more significantly talented than the other options, I go back to my old buddy, Jim Schwartz, who will be in here Monday. Startup costs. Get him out of the way. You know, he's better. And he's taking 13 reps. So as impressive as he was today, remember, you know, Reed did not play. Uh, so they started with Kayvon Wallace and, and Terrell Edmonds. Um, and then they're mixing in Justin Evans before Sidney Brown. It's like, why? Why? Um I can't answer that question. I mean, I, I'm going to live with the startup cost with Sidney Brown. To me, it should be Reed Blankenship and Sidney Brown playing safety for this team in week one. I think the Eagles look at it a little bit differently. 
We've been hearing a lot from training camp about how good Jalen Carter and Nolan Smith look. And obviously we saw it, Jalen Carter, right away. <laughs> Do you think Nolan Smith showed his true talents tonight? You think that he had some growing pains in his first NFL game? Well, I, you know, Nolan's uh, interesting, you know, because he's he's so undersized, but he's so uh, uh, fast and athletic. And you saw it on the one pass rush. He was uh, hairs, uh, a hair away from sacking the quarterback. He got a quarterback hit, had this great move where he dipped the shoulder uh, around the tackle. Um, it's something you rarely see from rookie players. That was like a savvy um, old school veteran pass rusher move. So I, I think he's going to be a great pass rusher. Are, are teams going to take advantage of him at times and, and run support? Yeah, you have to live with it uh, a little bit because he is an undersized player. Uh, but when he's doing that much damage on the pass rush, I think the Eagles will be fine with it. And remember, it's a luxury because he gets to sit behind um, not only Hassan Reddick and Josh Sweat, but also Brandon Graham. And you have Derek Barnett as well. They have so much depth on the edge. They can bring Nolan Smith along uh, uh, slowly. But you saw it with all three of those guys. Jalen Carter only had two reps that I saw. And one of them – Poor Ben Cleveland. He's an ex-teammate of, of Jalen's at Georgia. I mean, that's the kind of – I've been talking about this since the Eagles drafted. That kid's different. I mean, he is just uh, uh, unbelievably gifted and talented as an interior pass rusher. You got to see a little um, um, brief glimpse of it. Uh, he's going to be a really good player. Uh, and, and, you know, if he didn't have the off-the-field issues – you always worry about quarterbacks getting pushed up in the draft, but he he was the best player in this draft, a, a, a pure football standpoint. Um, and to be a Super Bowl team and to get that kind of talent in the draft is is pretty amazing. Absolutely. Uh, John, you heard uh, Nick Sirianni after the game today address the media, of course, in his postgame press conference. Anything jump out to you from that other than injuries, per se, with uh, Quez Watkins uh, and uh, Britton Covey as well? Uh, anything else come out of that press conference? Well, the biggest was because uh, I thought I had thought that Gainwell was getting, as I mentioned, the, the deference treatment. I thought Britton Covey was as well and Quez. Um and it, and it turns out with, with the receivers, it was the hamstring issues. They both are dealing with a hamstring. And I told you his explanation uh, with the running backs. I'm not, I'm certainly buying it with the receivers. I don't know if I'm, uh, if I'm buying it with the running backs. We'll see when Cleveland gets in here on Monday. Um, so, you know, you saw Zach McPherson take some punt returns. I'm saying, wow, where'd that come from? Um, because, I mean, he has never taken a rep as a punt returner in practice, ever, Zach McPherson. Um, and all of a sudden, he's out there returning punts. And all of a sudden, it comes clear uh, Britain uh, is injured. Uh, Quez takes reps in practice. He's injured. Greg Ward got injured in the game, uh, kind of tweaked his uh, – Looked like he tweaked his hamstring on on that fourth and one conversion. By the way, Greg Ward was great today, guys. Just just rock solid. Uh, I saw him after. He seems fine, but he tweaked it. So all their punt returners, A.J. Brown takes punt return reps. De Devontae Smith takes punt return reps for high leverage situations. Obviously, they weren't playing. So, that's why Zach McPherson was taking punt return reps. There were no punt returners left. You mentioned how good Greg Ward looked tonight. How many wide receivers do you think this team's going to keep? Because you have to think A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, Quez Watkins, and probably even Alameda Zacchaeus with them sitting him tonight are probably locks to make this team. Are they going to keep more than five wide receivers? Probably not, but, I mean, you have to realize, and, and Nick points this out all the time, especially with the new roster rules that are only a couple years old now, it's really a 69-man roster. So you might have two or three receivers on the practice squad, and it becomes that sort of game of strategy uh, for Howie Roseman. Who can you get through waivers? 
who can you not get through waivers or you feel you might be in danger of losing them. I don't seem to be honest. You know, there are certain team, there are certain positions, namely defense, the defensive line. And, and when I say that, I mean the edge rushers and, and the interior players. Um, tremendous depth. They're going to have to cut players that are NFL level players. I, I don't think they have that kind of depth at wide receivers. So, the Joseph Nottas of the world, um, the Tyree Clevelands who played very well today, even the Greg Wards who's steady, but you know he doesn't have the speed to scare people. Um, you can get those guys through waivers and get them on the practice squad, and I I think that's how the Eagles will go about it. Uh, is you know have five on the fifty three and carry two or three on the practice squad. Uh, John, real simple, stock up, stock down, and I am going to take Sidney Brown out of this conversation, but uh, who is an eagle that definitely raised their stock in this game and who hurt their stock the most in this game? Who hurt their stock the most? You know, it's tough to say. I thought uh, Kaylee Ringo had a really bad uh, drive when the Ravens scored uh, that, that they on that 37-yard run. He, he went inside when the back was cutting and outside and, and really didn't support it very well. Then he got beat right off the line of scrimmage near the goal line by Devin DuVernay. But, I mean, he's going to be the sixth corner on this team. So, I mean, I, I don't it, – it's not like he was threatening to, to play. Uh, but, I, you know, as a young guy, if you think about – we just talked about the rookies and, and how impressive Carter was and – his two reps and Smith with the pass rush and Sidney Brown with the burst. He didn't get that same kind of feeling uh, with Ringo. So he might be the most high profile one, unless you want to go down to Ian book as the fourth quarter. I mean, that's <laughs> over. That's <laughs> over. I, that's not, that, over. Not, not, not that it was a race to begin with, but yeah, Tanner McKee played uh, well. Uh, I think Marcus Mariota's stock, I think, you know, he had two drives, 14 plays and 12 drives. Yeah, at 12 plays. Um, he converted third downs, fourth downs with, with his legs. He's been so much better since Josh Andrews got here, and he doesn't have to ruin reps with the bad snaps. Uh, so he continues on the upward trend as well. Um, and, and you know, when you get down to the third string players, I, I don't, I don't, I mean, can we really call it? If, if you're taking 13 reps, and this is what bothers me about Sidney Brown, if you're taking 13 reps, is it really stock down? Your stock is already down. You can only go so low. Um, and that's why I kind of don't understand, you know, take the shrink wrap off Sidney Brown. Uh, that is the one thing I don't understand. And I think they will this week, to be fair. Yeah, one of the things, you know, they're going to look for areas that they can improve and I'm sure Sirianni's going to have fun with it this week, but too many penalties in this game. They had seven penalties for 40 yards, a lot of pre-snap penalties. And you know, what did you think about that? Is that something you think Sirianni, the way he preaches this type of stuff, he's probably going to be all over him this week? John, we still have you, brother? Sorry, I lost you for a second, but I'm back. Do you have uh, me? Bill yeah, had a question about the penalties. Yeah, I said, you know, they're going to be looking for things that they can improve on, they can work on. They did have seven penalties for 40 yards. You think Sirianni's going to lean into them about that? Not really. I mean, always about penalties, but they've been sloppier in practice, so I think it was an improvement. Uh, like, that's that's been one of the issues in, in practice. Uh, 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 almost every day, a bunch of pre-snap penalties. So believe it or not, I think they were trending in a positive direction uh, and there was something, the pass interference call, we were talking about that. That was clearly pass interference, uh, the, the, the offensive pass interference. Um, so some of them, you know, some of them are real penalties. But anytime you have pre-snap penalties, yeah, you want to clean that up. But uh, it, the Eagles have been really struggling with that in, at practice. And, and it was actually sort of smoother than I expected, to be honest. 
Gotcha. Uh, John, just uh, last thing for me, when it comes to the coordinators, anything jump out there? Obviously, you could point to penalties as being an issue, but between Sean Desai and uh, Brian Johnson, uh, anything said about those guys after the game? Um, yeah, I asked Nick about both of them and how the dry run went, and he was, you know, understandable. He's not going to say anything bad. I, I did, I do think it went pretty well, especially offensively. As I said, those first two drives, I mean, they went 14 plays and 12 plays, so that's pretty impressive. You'd like to punch it in, obviously. Uh, and Jake Elliott had the missed field goal, which was more about a bad snap and a, a new holder. Um, and ironically, if he makes that field goal, they probably win the game and stop the greatest streak in sports. But uh, <laughs> um, un unfortunately, Jake wasn't able to get it through. And and by the way, seeing I want to thank Great Greedy Williams because he missed a tackle at the end of the, the first half. And that enabled Justin Tucker to come in and kick a 60-yard field goal. That guy... And, and it would have been good from at least 65, maybe 70. Mm. And and it's funny because you're sitting here and, and the fans are right in front of us here in the press box. And there's like 50 Tucker jerseys. They, they got place kicker jerseys in Baltimore. Greatest <laughs> kicker of all time. And I've been covering this league for 25 years. And I said, there's some cool things you see. Tom Brady, when he was in Philadelphia for joint practices years ago, just shredding the Eagles and they were shaking their heads and cursing about his accuracy. And I'm getting to see Justin Tucker just boot one through from 60. That was, I don't often get, that was pretty cool. Cause that's the greatest kicker of all time. Uh, and by the way, Nick Sirianni, he wanted to win this game. Like, I, I don't think he him, cared. Steven, don't. seeing him on the side, I don't know if he has that gear. Like I understand most preseason games. Sure. But I think if there was ever a preseason game he wanted to win, I think this one was it. You know, I was looking for that. I, I just didn't get it. I, I just okay. don't think – I, I don't okay. think – you know, Baltimore, I kind of figured it out. I mean, they start Josh Johnson at quarterback, and I'm like, right. how do they win 23 straight uh, preseason games? And I'm thinking, you, you guys remember Josh Johnson from the NFC Championship game, the fourth quarter? Guy is 100 years old, can't play at all. And the Eagles completely dominated the first half. That's where they should have won the game. Mm. And all of a sudden, they start the second half, and Tyler Huntley's out there. That's their second-string quarterback. <laughs> That's the guy who made the Pro Bowl when Lamar Jackson was hurt. It's one of the best backup quarterbacks in football, and he's shredding the third-teamers. I, that's not relevance. I, I don't think Nick cares at all. He's all right. very competitive, yeah. all right. but I don't think Harbaugh he cares clearly. All. Harbaugh clearly cares, though. It's interesting. Yeah, I think so, he does by what he did with Huntley. It's like yeah, it's crazy. It's 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 a waste of time, but it's it's a crazy anomaly. Yeah. I mean, that goes back to 2015. To they have not lost a preseason game. It's pretty amazing. John, this is actually – we buried the lead here. I forgot to ask the most important question. It's the last thing I swear. This is the last one. Did they have the crab cake balls in the press conference? They did, they did not. They, they did, did not. not. Wasted uh, trip. Wasted trip. Oh, you, you have Why no you idea, go? Mark. It usually takes me an hour and a half to get down here. It took me three hours. Three hours because there were two accidents on, on 95. Rain? Was there a little rain? There was no rain, just bumper to bumper. And then uh, anybody who's ever been to MT and Banks the stadium, the parking situation, they, they don't have signs. Yeah, it sucks. And I'll they change it. it, it and they, and, you know, you're a Baltimore guy. And they keep changing our lot. So it's not like, well, I was, I was here in 2016. So he goes, no, it's a different lot every time. <laughs> I'm asking everybody in town, where's the F lot? Nobody knows. <laughs> Let me know when you get the Dundalk, the mean streets of Halliburton Avenue. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, John, great catching up as always. Thanks so much. Uh, we'll be looking forward to Birds 365 all this week with you and Jody back as well. John, thanks, bud. All right, thanks, thanks guys. Safe travels. The great John McMullen joining us right there. Yeah, don't mess with Halbert Ave, man. Don't, don't mess you up there. Uh, when we come back, we'll uh, give our final thoughts on the Eagles preseason opener for Bill Calarulo. I'm Mark Farzetta. We'll be back in a few here on the Jacob Media YouTube channel.